Yeah, and just so, just as the quick introduction and to frame things, um, I'm Paul Ebersman. I work at Infoblox um, in our IPv6 group. And a lot of what I do is I go out and talk to people and sort of collect their experiences of what they've had in the way of good and bad things, rolling things out. I'm also one of the people that goes, actually I am the person that goes to the IETF for Infoblox to participate and see what's coming down the pike. So um, basically what I'm doing here is sort of sharing what are the things that we have probably all gotten used to doing and have stopped questioning as assumptions because we've been doing it so long in V4, some of the new things in V6 and what that might do to change how we're sort of tearing apart and building up our new networks. Um, so there's a lot of material here. I'm going to be going through some of it a little fast, um, but it is on the slides. My email is also on the slides. Um, and I am also going through so I can have five or ten minutes at the end for some question and answer. So um, basically, like I said, the, the, the assumption here is that um, you don't want to have, you know, a 70s leisure suit mentality about your network. Um, we have been doing the same thing with v4 for years because we have been out of v4 addresses functionally for years. And we have done things with NAT in 1918 and clever pool sizes and all sorts of other crap to try and keep things glued together. And we've gotten so used to the pain that we now design our networks that way as if that is correct. And the reality is, is that no, that is the best way to deal with what we have. And a lot of that is different in v6. So. There are a huge number of changes. The IETF loves changes because they don't actually have to make things operationally ready. Um, myth is that change is good. Well, not necessarily, but we are all going to be dealing with it. Um, V6 is pretty much inevitable at this point. The only question is when you're going to be putting it into which places in your network and how are you going to be migrating gradually to have your V4 probably move further and further to the edges. There are a lot of things that we have sort of gotten used to as this is what we don't have, um, particularly address space and subnetting space, that are no longer issues. And um, the other thing I, I tend to emphasize is this is probably as big a paradigm shift as when we all went from classful addresses to CIDR in how we think about everything in our backbone and how we do our address usage. It is at least as educationally challenging or disruptive to our lives if not more. Some of the good news. Um, there are a bunch of things that we did learn about, and they are there in v6 that are, it's going to allow a6 on routers to be much more efficient at the point at which we have v6 only backbones, um, and you don't have to switch v4 packets. Um, it's a fixed header size, so you know exactly how many um, bits to snap off the front. Instead of having variable length and all of the options built into this amorphous blob, um, there's now an extension header chain. One of the other efficiencies is that the router-specific extensions are all at the front of the chain. So any intermediate device between the sender and the destination, as soon as they hit a non-relevant header, they can stop parsing. Um, flow labels are better placed in the headers and potentially may be useful for that wonderful mythical unicorn we call quality of service. Um, another good thing in some ways, um, there is no intermediate fragmentation anymore. There is path MTU discovery. Only the sender is allowed to fragment packets now, so you don't have middle layer boxes screwing up fragmentation and reassembly, which has been one of the many things that those middle layer boxes do to make our lives more interesting. Another one was there are no checksums because there are checksums in the layer below and above it. There is really no need. So all of these things together mean that router code will be at the point where if it's in ASIC and it's v6 native only, we'll be able to shovel significantly more bits potentially and have more control over things like flow-based routing. Um, there are some things on the local wire too. I will call it the broadcast domain, though there is no actual broadcast in v6, but it's the same thing, one single virtual wire. First of all, there is no broadcast. It's all multicast, which is one single sender to multiple recipients who have subscribed to messages of that type. And they're well-known types. So if you want to reach all the routers on the subnet, there's a specific reserved address. If you want to get to the DHCP servers or relays or a recursive DNS server or all the hosts, they're all there. And you can send in only those entities that care about being that type of box will need to listen. Um, and neighbor solicitation and solicited node is the replacement for ARP, how you take a MAC address and turn it into a v6 address on the local wire. Um, 
it's hashed on the last 24 bits. So again, even that, which in theory is a broadcast, only the people whose last 24 bits of their host address need to even listen. And ICMPv6 has become much more granular and specific in all of its types, so you can be much more particular about what you filter and do and don't allow. All of those together mean that there is less overhead on a local wire. Now, this doesn't mean that we'll be able to go up from 256 hosts for 1,000 hosts to 18 quintillion, but it does mean that we'll probably get 20 or 30 percent more hosts on a single broadcast domain than we used to once we're v6 only and not dual stack. So, one of the things I love about v6 is we have been calling ourselves network architects for years, but we're really more like plumbers um, and possibly even handymen. We are taking duct tape and bailing wire to our networks. We aren't architecting anything. v6, we actually have a chance again to do what our job title says, actually design the, the network that we are going to be using. And one of the big things is we can actually subnet again, and subnetting is not how can I fit as many hosts as possible into the address space I have right now. You can actually design it. You can make it map to however you divide up your networks so that your subnetting plan actually immediately falls over into how you do your ACLs and your security, and I'll have a sample um, example of how you could do this based on geography to give you some ideas. One of the things I stress very, very heavily when you're figuring out your address space and what you need, count everything, all your 1918 space, everything you use, and then get global unicast space enough for all of it, public routable space. There is a 1918 equivalent called unique local, ULA, in v6 but it has the same disadvantage as the 1918 does. It's not guaranteed unique. It's more likely to be unique, but it's not guaranteed. Um, it's not routable on the internet. If you get global unicast space enough for everything now, you have choices. You don't have to NAT if it needs to get to the internet for some reason. You can filter it if you don't want it to be out on the internet. You may even use ULA in places in your network, but get enough address space so that you have the choice of using non-routable space, not getting stuck using non-routable because you can't get enough routable space. Um, and again, do a scheme that aggregates well so that your announcements are clean. Um, you know, let's help with the DFZ and the routing tables, actually make it better. Um, some basic rules of thumb, pretty much the, the longest prefix that anybody but considers routable right now is this 48. So if you have two separate sites that you both need to have on the internet, you will need to have a 48 for each of them. Even if they don't need that much subnetting space, that is the equivalent of the 22 or the 24 in IPv4. Current recommendation is also anything that is not a point-to-point -point link, anything that has any form of end host whatsoever, give it a slash 64 as the subnet size. Um, don't go longer than that. There are already boxes that hard code that the rightmost 64 bits is the host. Yes, that violates the specs. Yes, that is broken. Congratulations, we have broken boxes on our network. Never happened before. Um, for point to points, the recommendation is for security reasons, use a 127. Um, don't allow anything other than two endpoints. There are proponents that say you should use a 64 for everything, including point to points. Ignoring the it wastes lots of address space, which I think should at still at least be thought of. It's not a huge point, but there are security reasons. Read that RFC. That will explain it. Um, if you want to truly have every subnet everywhere is always 64 no matter what, the current compromise is you allocate a 64 for that point-to-point -point link, but you only configure a slash 127. That way you get the um, allocation ease of a single subnet size, but you have the security problem dealt with. Um, any place you'd use a slash 31 in your current network, you'd use a 127. Any place that you would use a slash 32, usually loopbacks that you pass around in your IGP, you'd use a 128. Um, my recommendation is if you are not doing the 64 for everything everywhere, take 164 that is all of your point-to-point -point links, 164 that is all of your loopbacks, and that is per routing area. Obviously, if you have discontinuous areas, you will need to give 64s to each. One of the reasons that that's good is you then have a 64 that is the loopback for every router and every networking device in your network. And it's really easy to put in an ACL that says SSH to and from those works to your NOC. Just an another example of how you can actually make your ACLs make sense easily. Here's a sample plan. Basically, in V4, 8-bit boundaries are easy. Anytime that you do a subnet that is, or a prefix length that is a, 
a multiple of 8, it's easy because you are not dividing the number between the dots in the IPv4 address. We have done that with CIDR, but it's not as easy. The equivalent is that there are 128 bits in a V6 address, 32 hexadecimal characters. That's four bits or a nibble for each one of those hex characters. So again, to make your life easy, if all of your prefix lanes are, are divisible evenly by four, you are never dividing in the middle of one of those letters. For right now, that's a whole lot more readable and there's enough space to do that. And even the, the RIRs and LIRs are doing that in allocation. Um, Infoblox has eight sites that have no backbone between them. We didn't need more than a 48 in terms of subnetting for our entire company, but we had eight sites. So when we went to Aaron and said, we have eight sites, they are physically distant from each other. They said, okay, you need a 48 for each of them. 16 of them would be plenty for you, therefore we will give you a 44. And that was our whole justification. It wasn't how many hosts, it wasn't anything else. It was, we have eight separate sites, so we need a 44. Done. In this case, this is one where I'm a data center, and I am in multiple cities, and within a city I may have multiple buildings that I have equipment, and what I usually do is I break it down all the way down to VLAN, and I usually have a customer per VLAN. In this case, I just go through of how many of each do I need. Well, in my example, I assume I have 12 cities, so 16 possible is enough, so 4 bits is enough. If I had needed 24 cities, I would have had to jump up to the next chunk, which would have been 8 bits, and it would have been 256. Yes, I'm wasting space, but it made my scheme work. And we have enough space to do that. So what this means is by the time I get to a 64 for a VLAN, I not only know the customer, I know exactly which city I'm in, I know which switch I'm in, I know which VLAN. It's all completely self-documenting. I don't even need to do reverse pointers to know exactly where that customer is. And it's all about subnets. We are no longer counting hosts like we do in V4. It is not I have 256 hosts, therefore I need a a slash 22 or a slash 19, whatever. It is how many subnets. And even when you get your allocation, if I get a slash 36 from right, what they're actually going to do is they're going to take a 32. They're going to give me the first half of that 32, and they're going to block the other half and reserve it in case I need it later. That way, if it turns out my allocation scheme didn't work, I go back to them and they say, okay, here, just change your prefix length, use the other half, you don't have to renumber, it just works. So again, get everything you need, get it now, get it while the RIRs are being generous. And yeah, um, there are some limitations. There are 18 quintillion possible addresses in 64, but again, I've talked about this. Layer two stuff trumps. You, know, you will still get a couple thousand entities on an end device. Um, and last point, at some point we may not be able to do nibbles. We may be doing CIDR on V6. I predict we will because we have a, a history of wasting any amount of anything we've ever been given. Um, but at least while we can make it sane for ourselves, let's enjoy it. And use the whole 64, particularly for things like pool sizes. You know, one of the things that has always been touted as V6 is, is more secure is they can't do brute force scans. Well, that's true. But if what I do is I say that I'm on dot one dot whatever, you know, 192.168.1 for a subnet, and my host is dot 100, I can certainly say 2000 colon DB8 colon one is my prefix. I can do colon colon 100, and that's the same host. Very easy, very self-documenting. And for my service machines, I do that. But I've also now just reduced the scannable space that I need to worry about from 18 quintillion to 256, which is brute force scannable. So if you want that protection, use the whole pool. Um, you may have figured out that I have certain opinions about 1918 and that. Um, they are probably one of the worst things we ever did to, each, to ourselves back when we were running out of address space in the 90s and the IATS said we need to go to IPv6, um, all, everyone said, well, gee, isn't there something we can do? Just, you know, munge addresses around. And we said, no, no, no we can't do that. Um, it won't scale, it, performance is lousy, there's security problems. And they, and they said, no, 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 we really need something right now. Okay, and we gave them NAT. And the problem was NAT actually worked. Didn't work well, but it did work better than a non-existent v6. 
and it put off v6 implementation by a dozen years easily. Um, did it ever make sense? Well, yes. We were running out of space. We, we were, they were still debating tuba and all sorts of other alternatives to what became IPv6 back when we were almost out, and they just couldn't get it together. So it wasn't widely available. There was no DHCPv6 for another seven years. Um, people were desperate. Um, they would take anything. Um, I personally think there were hallucinogenic substances being filtered around. And somehow we thought this might be an acceptable way to get past this for now. And what we have been left with is 12 years of hell. Well, why is it still around if it sucks that badly? Well, because there isn't still right now enough V4 space and V6 is not ready for enough people. And there is the it's more secure. Let me shoot on that one. What we did was we, we were stuck with NAT and we were trying to make ourselves feel better. So we were rationalizing that maybe there was something actually good about this whole thing where you have this one public address and this whole slew of private addresses behind. Well, is there anything good? Well, it obscures my users. You can't get to my users. They have to initiate the connection. OK. So A, that's not NAT. That's the stateful firewall that happens to be implemented by most NATs. And B, that assumes that the attackers are coming in from the outside. Reality has shown us is that users are lazy and stupid and that it's much easier to trick them into coming out and doing an established session so it's no security anyway because most of the exploits are being done from the inside by our little users. Other things that it has done um, is we have wound up with a whole series of protocols that are rather twisted and icky in design, Skype in particular, could have been a vastly cleaner architecture if we had had enough public address space everywhere and not had to punch through NAT in most homes. So the emperor is naked. There are no clothes. How naked? Well, NAT is not security. Um, as I said, it is a stateful firewall conflated with the address translation. If you want to have that protection, there is no reason you can't have a public address on one side and multiple public addresses on the other and get the same obscuring. And it will have the same painful debugging. It will have the same congestion issues. It will have the same denial of service vulnerabilities, all of the breaking of end-to-end, -end, and all of the other things we know and love with NAT. So if you really feel that the NAT experience is positive for you, you can create, recreate all of that pain with a stateful firewall without ever implementing NAT. But of course, we, we do like to suffer. Um, I have a whole series of things I call beer bets. I bet a beer that because there are people that have security audit checklists that say, do you use NAT? And it's a box that says yes or no. And if you say no, you fail your audit. There will be people, particularly the US government and DOD, who will mandate NAT. Therefore, even though the IETF has said NAT 6.6 will not happen, we will never do it. Well, if they don't, what will happen is the U.S. government will wave a large check and some vendor will go, you betcha, like Cisco, and they will write a NAT66 equivalent. And Juniper will write one and everybody will write one and they won't interoperate and they will still suck. But there will be NAT66, whether we like it or not. And there will be people using stateful firewalls because they do feel the need for that protection. And if you really feel the need of having all of the problems with non-unique addresses, and address collision potentially and not routable and having to renumber if you need to get to the internet, all the stuff that happens with 1918 spaces, you can recreate all of those particular problems by using ULA. So the next marvelous thing the IETF talked about, MAC addresses. They felt that MAC addresses were fundamentally evil because they were not pure. They are not always unique. You can buy hardware, and you, there are some scummy vendors, and we've all had them, who will clone the MAC address across multiple boxes, and you're stuck. You can change it in software if you're not a nice person, and pretty much all of the OSs will do that. And if you have multiple interfaces on the same box and you try and DHCP to the same DHCP server, whichever interface gets their first wins. So I can't get multiple addresses on the same box. That's true. 
What the IETF didn't consider was that, yes, all of those are flaws that are indeed part of MAC addresses. But 99.99% .99 of the entire universe gets onto the Internet via either a service provider or a company that uses DHCP and uses MAC address. And the Internet hasn't stopped working. As a matter of fact, it, it keeps ongoing. So obviously, while it is not perfect, it seems like a pretty workable solution for the vast majority of the universe. Uh, but the IETF knows better than 99.99% .99 of the world. So they came up with the DHCP unique identifier. And it does have some things that are definitely significantly better. There is one identifier per host, either server or client. Every network interface has an identity association, or IA, that identifies that particular network interface. That pairing, therefore, is unique. So I can do DHCP with a DUID and an IA and get addresses. And a different interface on the same box will have a different IA, so the DHCP server knows. So we have solved the multiple interface box problem. And you can get privacy addresses. Um, you can get regular addresses, ULA, GUA. You can even get prefixes, and entire subnet ranges. Um, the problem, of course, is that an awful lot of people don't just use that as the key in the lease file. They actually use it for filtering of set-top boxes, all sorts of other things. A lot of companies want to be able to tell that Joe's laptop has these IPv4 and IPv6 addresses in their IP address management system. If you don't have the MAC address anywhere visible in the v6 address, there's no way of correlating those on the server side at the moment, though they are working on that. And persistent storage. The way it works is anything that is ISC-based in DHCP stores the DUID the first time that either you, as a client, ask for an address or as a server come up, and it stores it in the leases file on the disk on the machine. All of the Windows variants store it in registry where all things are stored. The nice thing is that if I change hardware and I restore, and that's in persistent storage, I come up as the new machine, it doesn't actually use my MAC address. That's actually a feature. But I'm IT. I just got a new laptop for my engineering department. I take the first one. I install all the software they're supposed to get. I test DHCP. I test DNS. I do everything else. Um, and I now know I have a working machine. And I now clone that across 11 other machines. And I didn't think to go, should I wipe the registry or the lease file first? I now have 12 machines with the same DUID in storage. So going back to why MAC is evil. Well, multiple interfaces has been solved. But the other two problems are not guaranteed unique, can be altered in software. S persistent storage DUID, not guaranteed unique, can be altered in software. So they have only solved one third of the problems for a fairly major paradigm shift. Um, and you should know how people generate it. Again, this is in the slides. And they are working on ways to correlate currently there is a draft um, at the IETF that is looking promising that will allow hardware address to be put back into the relay message if you go through DHCP relay, which realistically most large organizations would do. So that would allow you to at least store that information on the server. Um, the good side is that basically as long as Cisco, Juniper, and one or two other relay folks update their relay code, which can be done fairly quickly, and ISC and Microsoft put it into their servers, it's much faster than getting client OS updates which is why they decided not to fix it in the client. Um, the other thing is if you are using the option 82 in v4 there, option 17 and 30-something in v6, but circuit ID and remote ID, and you're using that as your identification currently for v4, that does work in v6. So one, of course, one of the other questions, DHCP or not, um, in v4, there's pretty much two ways of doing things. You statically configure, or you enable DHCP in a configuration, and it automatically DHCPs. It's the IETF. We love choices. So in v6, well, yes, you can still do static. And I personally recommend that for routers, networking devices, and large servers, that they be statically configured, things that don't change much and need to be found easily. Um, there is the big change, stateless auto config, Slack. This is where the box comes up on the wire, and it actually figures out from information on the network from the local router 
how to configure itself. Um, and I'll talk more about what's good and bad about that. Stateless DHCP says I get my address from the network via Slack, but I will get certain information, usually a DNS server, via DHCP. And then there's stateful DHCP, which is the full DHCP v6 experience. So Slack uses RAs, router advertisement messages. What this means is that instead of having a centralized solution where your DHCP servers for the entire enterprise or company are usually a fairly finite number in a fairly central location, every single router port on every VLAN and network, everywhere in your network that has any end host, now needs to be checked and configured. So if we have pushed the network policy, which is effectively the security policy, because for most of us, our IP address is a poor but only security token we have. So now suddenly our network and our security policy has been pushed to every device everywhere in our network. And audits have gone from a few dozen DHCP servers at a fairly large company to possibly thousands or tens of thousands of interface configuration lines. Um, it does mean it's much more resilient if there are fractures in your network, good and bad. You know, it's the whole decentralized versus centralized model. Things that are not in DNS or in RA messages, for quite a while you couldn't get a recursive DNS server. So you could get up, you could get a default router, you can get an address, but you didn't have DNS. Well, people pointed out that that was not exactly functional. So there's an RFC, and most of the RAs now do support this. Unfortunately, there is inconsistent client support. And again, getting client OSs updated. How many of you still have 32-bit XP users running around loose somewhere in your network? Yeah. Um, so the idea that we can update our clients. So for robustness and operational safety, we pretty much must use DHCP to give DNS, even though this option is now there. Now, DHCP does some cool stuff. You can get public and private address, privacy addresses. You can get all the things you, you normally got, you know, remote DNS, TFTP, vendor options, all the stuff that make those hideous things like our phones and our printers work. Um, you can even have the DHCP server update for forward and reverse pointers. But big change here, there is no default route in the DHCP server. You must get the default route via RA messages. So what we're reduced to is, you know, everybody used to classify this as the Slack folks versus the DHCP folks. There's no such thing. Slack won't work without DHCP, at least for DNS servers. And you don't even use DHCP until you're told to by bits that are set in the RA message. So you will be running both everywhere. Um, the way you're going to be choosing in most cases, if you are doing some kind of access control or filtering, um, logging, in any way, updating an IP address management system, IPAM, any of those things, you're probably going to need to use DHCP because you don't want people just randomly doing their own addresses because then you're the one that's gotten bit by the brute force scanning or you're logging into every router and looking into its equivalent of its ARP cache all the time and missing people. So you probably don't want anybody doing Slack if you are doing one of those. If you are currently updating um, DNS from the DHCP server and you find that more convenient than letting the clients scribble in dynamic zones themselves, which most people don't do other than absolutely pure Microsoft shops, again, that will be something that you'll probably consider. And um, if you like a more centralized method, you are running out of a central authority or you have lots of different devices, it's not mostly laptops, tablets, smartphones. You've got things like printers, phones, other things that use vendor options. All of those are pretty much going to push you to DHCP. Slack does have some distinct advantages in certain areas. We're not utilizing it as much yet, but in areas where you truly don't care, that's one of them. But it's local and it's very fast. It doesn't require getting to a DHCP server anywhere else. It's also very lightweight, which means that people who are writing embedded device stacks and aren't going to use existing code because they want it to be really small to fit in a very small amount of flash write shit code. DHCP clients are really hard. DHCP v6 clients are really hard. Slack is pretty straightforward. So things like um, remote devices or embedded devices that are going to be popping up and going away on our network, manufacturing lines, smart power sockets in our kitchens, things in our car that tell the dealer that we need an oil change, all those kinds of things are far more likely to use Slack. And also because it is completely decentralized. As long as you can get to the local router, you're up. 
And if you can't get to the local router, then it doesn't really matter if you have an address or not. And again, if you don't need any of the other stuff with logging or IPAM or, or, or DNS, it'll work just great. So look through your priorities, figure out which one is more important to you. One of the other ones is technical support staff. You know, if you have a certain level of, of technical expertise um, to maintain DHCP, that's fine. If the staff is the local barista at your coffee shop for the wireless hotspot, they can probably power cycle the right box most of the time. Slack is going to be a much more sane configuration. And then again, are you dealing with a lot of different gear? Um, and a couple of examples. This, again, it's in the slides, but there are bits. The um, address auto configuration flag says, should I configure my own address or not? Um, if it's zero, it says don't configure your own address. O and M bit are, O is other configuration, M is managed address. That means get all of my other configuration via DHCP, get an IP address from DHCP. So in this example, what I'm saying is A is zero, don't auto configure anything yourself. O and M, get both your address and all of your other configuration via DHCP. That's going to be as close as possible to the current DHCP v4. The only thing you'll be getting via RA would be default route. And then at the other end of the spectrum, if, if A is one that says do your own address, O other configuration, get something probably DNS via DHCP, but don't get an address. Everything comes in the RA messages. Another interesting idea that will be useful at some point in time, um, prefix delegation. I can actually Instead of giving you address, I can actually give you a whole prefix. And then you can carve out chunks of that to subordinate routers below you. So you can dynamically create a hierarchical network topology. The most common example given of this is a home, where you give the home router a 56. And then you might have a router that is in front of all of your audio video gear, you might have one in front of your kitchen. You might want to have one in front of your home office. We're getting to that point where many of us are actually doing things like QoS so that our kids streaming or playing World of Warcraft does not ruin our video conference. Um, we're not quite to the point where we're not flat space, but we'll get there. Um, potentially, this is very cool. Um, there are routers, vendors, and service providers that are working feverishly, particularly Comcast and Cable Labs to try and get workable implementations of this. There's an IETF group home net, but there are a lot of technical challenges. It is not yet there. I don't expect to see this in enterprise or large network environments for a while, yet there's a lot of things to shake out. ICMP. In v4, if I filtered everything, my debugging is more difficult, but my network still mostly works. And we do have those security Nazis who sit there and they say, ICMP, ooh, it's a security hole. We're going to disable it everywhere. Um, well, you can do that in IPv6, too. Um, however, unlike v4, if you do that, one of the things is you can't do duplicate address detection. So you have no way of dealing with two hosts trying to use the same address. You have no way of finding routers. You have no way of getting router advertisement messages. You have no way of finding servers for DHCP. You can't do path MTU discovery, so you have no way of knowing if the packets that you sent out were discarded by someone else because the size was bigger than they could pass on. Um, and there are certain other network errors. So if you don't care about having a usable, unique address, don't care about getting a default router, don't care about DNS and all the rest of it, and that's a usable network to you, filter away. Um, if, on the other hand, you might consider that to be kind of broken, even worse than a PIPA kind of network, um, you're going to need to do things more surgically. RFC 4890 is an actual operational recommendation best practices RFC. It is very well written, and it breaks things down into here's the stuff that you better not filter. Here's the stuff that you may want to filter, depending on what you're doing. Here's some things that, unless you have a really good reason, you probably want to filter. One of the other things that has changed. Um, Reverse pointers. So a little bit of history. Um, back in the dark ages, in the early 90s, um, I was working at then a small company called UUNet. Um, 
and we were running a fairly large FTP archive. So was uh, Washington University of St. Louis, so was DEC and a few other people. And we allowed anonymous FTP. And we pretty regularly got pieces of email, or occasionally faxes, um, explaining that they had trouble um, getting to our anonymous FTP server and that it wasn't working right. And we got tired of dealing with the stupidity. Um, so we decided that we were going to have an intelligence test. And the intelligence test was that if you could use VI and edit a IP sick or, you know, in adder.arpa file and get a delegation correctly and get anything at all into the R data portion of one of those PTR records, you were obviously clued enough that we were willing to respond to your email and let you get our software. And if you could not do that, obviously you were a wonk and you should just go away until you learned. Um, unfortunately, then what happened was we started going, well, gee, that did cut down some of our crap. And we got kind of tired of people with QMail, particularly, because usually they couldn't get SendMail working, um, not being able to exchange mail with us. So we said, well, let's give them the intelligence test. And this time around, we're going to say that the A and the PTR records have to actually match each other. And if they don't match, we just tell you to go away. Unfortunately, it, it escaped the lab um, and has been used on security and VPN collectors, and there are even certain websites these days that actually look at it for things like, I think the New York Times is one of them. And so the answer is that shit breaks if you don't have PTR records for your users. And since most of us can't afford to staff for stupid calls, we try and be proactive, and so we pre-populate. And so how do we do it? Well, occasionally we did it by hand, but you know, well, 256 addresses wasn't that bad. You know, most of us knew how to do clever things in VI and Emacs. Um, some of us wrote shell scripts, or Perl scripts. Um, Bind, of course, came up with Dollar Generate. Um, some people were even using their own homegrown IP address management systems. What we did was we pre-populated everything we owned, and so everything had a pointer record, whether it was used or not. And then the problem went away. Well, for v6, so I've got one subnet, 64. 18 quintillion possible addresses. So a PTR record is 34 labels long. And even if I'm generously assuming that it's about 60 bytes in wire format for the whole record in our data per record, 60 bytes times 18 quintillion, which is 4 billion times 4 billion, um, anybody here got a computer that has either that much disk space or even less likely that much RAM to hold that particular zone file? Yeah. Don't make your space on the planet. Uh, yeah, exactly. This is the it defies speed of light is is pretty much where it gets to, and that's 164, and you get 64,000 of those with a 48. So, what do we do? Well, my personal vote is admit it was a bad idea, and like I said, I was around. We were stupid and lazy. We have lived with it forever. I apologize personally that we just tried to get out of some stupid emails because we have been paying for it ever since. Unfortunately, the reality is that our users probably won't let us because there are enough things that are useful. And of course, pre-population. Well, if we can exceed speed of light, we might figure out how to do that, but it's not likely. What is more likely is, just like I recommend static routing for things like your routers, your networking gear, um, and your large servers, also by whatever means you have, your IPM system, scripts, whatever, pre-populate the reverse pointers for all of those boxes, so things like trace route work, so things like your mail MTA is not blocked by people, all of those good things. Then odds are for most people, most of us are using DHCP for most of our end hosts and transient hosts. Good. Microsoft and ISC will happily do zone updates, or you can let the client do it if you don't have issues with that. The last possibility is that, and when I was at ISC, we had people who requested this, can I just say, here's the R data, anytime somebody asks, and I'll just make it up? You bet, lie on the fly, um, which works until you want to do DNSSEC, at which point you either break, because DNSSEC shows you're lying, or you have the choice of putting your secret key out onto your public auth server and signing on the fly, <laughs> um, which is computationally expensive and which is an interesting self-denial of service vector. Um, I suspect that vendors will be doing lie on the fly and ignoring DNSSEC for a long time. Um, pick your poison. Well, ignoring it for the PTR records doesn't mean you have to ignore it for the forward zone either. 
Right. And as some people have also pointed out in all of these, there are certainly ways of wildcarding it if you understand how DNSSEC signing of wildcards. If I do all, all sorts of gobbledygook.mydomain.com, I can actually sign it so only mydomain.com is signed. And I say specifically only the last two labels are actually signed and validated. All this other stuff may be there, but I have not certified that it's okay. And my guess is that very few people are doing VDNS sec validation and checking anything other than they got the AD bit set. So you could probably get away with that too. But So standards, we love them. We love them so much that we just can't stop making them. Um, there are currently over 200 active and current RFCs relating to IPv6 and DHCPv6. There are closer to 250 active drafts in the IETF that are not yet RFCs that are being worked on. There are at least a half dozen to a dozen new ones added every single ITF, and they meet three times a year. Simple, stupid math says, gee, OK, that means we're less than half done. Not quite that bad, but there are an awful lot of operational issues, things like the fact that most of us need a MAC address, not as the database key in DHCP, but to correlate v4 and v6 addresses. Another interesting thing for which there is a draft right now and nobody has a good answer. I am a dual stacked host and I am a multiple interface host. I am a pretty typical laptop. So I DHCP v4 and I get v4 addresses and maybe my DHCP server gives me DNS servers. I DHCP for two of my interfaces in v6 and I get addresses. Maybe I get two more sets of DNS servers. I is the client OS, what do I do? First one wins, last one wins. Combine them all. If I combine them all, how do I sort them? OS vendors come to the IETF and say, what should we do? And the IETF says, that's an operational issue. <laughs> well, yes, it is. <laughs> um, but most of us, I think, would realize, having seen what happened with Happy Eyeballs and all of the different versions that all the different browsers did, that it would be so much better if all of the OS vendors had a single way that they could all agree that they would take all of the stuff and stick it in so that you knew what your SCResolve.conf would be and not have to know what every single version of every operating system did differently. So, um, yeah, I know. It's... Um, I have carried a pager for an actual 15 real years of time in my life, which means that I don't like problems like this because they mean I get pager calls. So um, that's usually mine. One of the things that I do um, push on is because of that and the fact that there are a whole series of other operational issues. The IETF, when you first show up, if you're a vendor, they will really beat you senseless because obviously vendors are all evil. Um, but even if you're not a vendor but you're an operational guy, they will sit there and go, oh, well, you know, you operational guys, you know, if you were really clever, you'd be writing protocols. You have to sort of get past that one and just keep working with them because they do eventually start listening. And if we all go away and let them do whatever they think with no connection to the reality we all live in, we will be living with their decisions. And if we don't say it, it's like voting. If you don't vote, you don't get to whine. Well, you do get to whine, but it's not legit. Um, and so we need to vote. We need to, to actually send folks there. And if you can't convince your boss to go, you should definitely be making sure that all the vendors you buy gear from send people. And that should be one of your questions. Do you participate in the IETF actively? Do you send people to every meeting? Do you work on the standards? Do you keep track? Do you know what's coming down the pike? Because with v6, we have another couple of years of these drafts coming through and changing. And the last thing is that because of the fact that a lot of this, the ITF somewhat legitimately um, is now reacting when someone comes in and says, gee, this doesn't work with my network. It doesn't work with my provisioning system. Um, we need this new thing. The ITF says, well, gee, you know, we've been working on this for the last seven or eight years. Where were you? Why should we listen to you? Why don't you do things the way we figured them out? Okay. To some degree, that's legit because they have already gone through. Um, stuff like no default route um, in DHCP. 
it's probably dead. It has been beaten so bloody at this point that no one is going to stick their head up and say, what do we do? Um, but the reality is, is that some people have worked around it. John Brzezowski at Comcast went to the ITF, and the ITF said, that's stupid. DHCP sucks. This is all stupid. MAC addresses are broken. Get over it. And so John said, well, I have customers, and I need to get this working. So he went to Doxis, because he said to the ITF, hey, can you put this in vendor options? They said, oh, yeah, you can put any shit you want in vendor options. That's what it's there for. You know, have a field day. Have your vendor get a number. We don't care what you put in there. So he said, great. And he went to the Doxis folks, and he got standards done. And they are now rolling out things that use the vendor options and use Doxis 3. And it works. And it works for Comcast and all the vendors they work with. Well, there are now other folks, other ISPs and broadband ISPs who have been coming in and saying, well, we don't do it that way. That breaks our whole provisioning model. We need it changed. And John quite legitimately says, well, you know, I've been beating myself senseless for years now. Where were you? Show up and pick what's important because you can't fix everything. So that's a quick blast through. Yes. Yes, and it's, most of the work's done mailing. Yes, that's, that's the form of showing up when it comes to ICF. Yes, and, and yes, for, for the folks that didn't hear, um, yes, you don't have to go to the meeting. Showing up on the working group mailing list is showing up, and much of the work is done there. And they have video casts, and you can mail stuff to the working group chairs and let them know your vote on things that are being discussed. You can be a full and useful participant without ever physically showing up. Yeah, they're, they're, they are very good at, at all of the normal. They have chat, they have Jabber, they have video cast, they have email. Um, so there are a lot of ways to participate. Because, yeah, they, it's all over the world. It's expensive. Um, this is the first job I've ever had where I have been sent to every ITF um, and not work for someone like a megalith like Cisco. So um, I went through it quickly because I figured there are probably a lot of questions on things that you have dealt with or... Um, wondering on holes of, you know, gee, we do it this way, is that going to work in B6? So um, if you want to go ahead and step to the microphone and ask away. Yeah. This will be a fun one. Hi, Leif Sawyer um, from Alaska. That pretty much explains everything. Um, so I, I work for a telecommunications company up there, a three-letter one. and. <laughs> Um, I've been a proponent of IPv6 for probably the last 12 years there. And in trying to get the, uh, the company to start looking at IPv6 internally, you know, work with the IT system architect. And we have to follow PCI guidelines. So they want NAT. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when I said, well, give me a proposal for what your plans for IPv6 rollout would include. And so their site local addresses and locate. And I look at it, and I'm wondering why are we allowing that kind of thing to propagate? Because it just breaks so many different things within a large business. And I, I, I'm looking, I guess, for, for help in how I can combat that and that. Right. Well, there are Brain. several pieces. Um, right. Right. So one of them, site local has been deprecated. Um, if you want to use 1918, now you use unique local. Um, that was another one of the unique local was supposed to be um, within one area. Site local um, was supposed to be across an entire enterprise, but they could never define what site meant. Um, so they gave up. Um, as far as the NAT, yes, that is the reality. Um, that's, like I said, why NAT 6.6 or some equivalent will happen. But the reality is, is the security piece that they are looking for actually is the stateful firewall. Um, so my reaction is normally use GUA for everything and go through and then use stateful firewall. There are, however, NAT solutions out there, including quote unquote carrier grade NAT that are certainly functional if you want to spend that kind of money. Um, there are things that will function for those. And ULA isn't horrible. I, I look at things like 1918 addresses and views and DNS um, and certain other things as it's your absolute last choice. 
after you've exhausted all other possible more sane and more scalable and more supportable technical solutions, if what is left is that, then implement it. But you should have exhausted all other possibles first. Um, unfortunately, when you get into blind compliance rules, where it's a checkbox where you say yes or no, and if you say no, you fail, um, we have a lot less flexibility. And so I suspect that you will be one of those lucky people rolling out a NAT 6.6. Yeah, which which makes me cringe, but unfortunately, and I suspect that PCI and HIPAA and a few other people that blindly go through, but what's your take? So, so first of all, PCI actually does provide for, um, you, you don't have to use NAT if you can show that you've got equivalent uh, security. Or right, which is the stateful controls. firewall. Is and the stateful firewall qualifies for that, and about 40% of the PCI auditors have now been, uh, larted to the point of being clueful enough to understand that. Ah, better than when I used to do it. Okay, so that's good other, to hear. The other the other 60% still need large larts applied. Uh, please do so uh, repeatedly. Uh, if you want help with ammunition, um, Scott Hogue and I recently wrote a blog post that's up on the InfoBlox IPv6 Center of Excellence discussing why, you know, you can get NAT in IPv6 if you really determined to do bad things to your network, but you probably don't actually want to. Yeah. Um, NATs are not good. NATs are not helpful. NATs are just damage. Yes. So well, as let's, let's we, not add them to V6, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I don't know if you were here for that section with the slides, but NAT die, die, die was my intro slide. So it, it sort of gives my opinion on what we should be doing with it. But there are certain realities. Um, there are a whole series of education things, including also how do I justify you know, so it makes my network more expensive, it makes my network more brittle, I, exp I expend all this more money, and it doesn't get me anything better. That's another one of those, how do, yeah, right, exactly. And so how do I justify spending for IPv6? Um, it's another one of the common questions, but um, go ahead. Uh, my name is Andrew Sullivan, um, and I am a protocol weenie. Um, and I, I just want to say, um, in line with this NAT 6.6 stuff and the other vendor thing that you were mentioning a minute ago, be careful what you wish for here. There are lots of vendors who want to sell this crap. And so part of the call for participation is both, you know, towards the auditing types and towards the standards people. We need real operators who are really there saying, no, this was a stupid idea the first time. We're certainly not going to do it now when we've got all this address space. It's, it's super critical on this issue. We've got to get real operators in the room. Yes, and, and along those lines where I was talking about carrier grade now, one of the things that um, a lot of those folks are now pushing is, well, you get V6 native and you let that go out and all of your V4 stuff will get carrier grade natted. And they say, well, hey, it works for LTE and cellular. Um, and, and I have several responses. One of them is, yes, it works for a certain dollar value um, if you want to keep giving someone like Huawei or Cisco insane numbers of dollars forever, because they are certainly happy to keep selling you hardware forever. Um, the other thing is that, yes, Currently, 40% of all Verizon um, traffic is V6 native, and 25% of AT&T is V6 native. And they are hoping that continues, because they are using carrier-grade NAT for the other piece of it. So far, there are several reasons why they have not gotten caught. Um, one of them is that the handsets are not yet using enough data-intensive applications to make it immediately noticeable. Most users are not sophisticated enough to know that it's a V4 site that I'm going to that's slow and a V6 site that's fast. Our expectation is if something sucks, it's cellular because cellular performance is uneven and sucks. So they have not yet gotten caught. The fact that there are more V6 things out there means they may actually win the battle because essentially what they are betting is that they will offload enough of it to V6 native before their CGNs run out of steam. But there are a few interesting twists. The user population that is sophisticated enough to notice this and will blast it everywhere in the world are World of Warcraft guys. And when we get to the point where there's a decent iPad app that actually works and they don't get killed using it, and they start using it and they notice V6 is snappy and V4 sucks on their cellular plan, they have all sorts of network tools and they, they are under, how many of you are actually backbone operators here? Yeah. Um, is, it not true that the most effective jitter measurement that you have in the world are online gamers. Yeah. yeah. They, they notice anything in your network way faster than any other knock tool you've ever had. Right. So those will, guys will start noticing. So we will start cashing up on those bets. 
Um, and carrier grade NAT is indeed a myth. It is not carrier grade. It is massively over-engineered um, to mostly survive in many cases. Um, and there are other little things that, that I don't think they've thought out. The fact that they still have to do everything with address and port, and that means for every one public address on there, you can get 64,000 simultaneous connections. Well, the reality is, is that's not a person anymore, even a household. These days, most browsers will have 10 concurrent sessions to parallel download. Um, if I'm at a house, it's pretty common to have three smartphones and two iPads in an awful lot of houses right now, all of which are acting like browsers. So my guess is we're going to get to the point where realistically you could probably have one to 2,000 homes per public address. And v4 space is getting ugly. RIPE just ran out September 17th. AP NIC is already out. So getting more space is going to be punitively expensive as well. So getting enough address space on the public side to actually NAT a big enough pool if you want to be a new business is becoming more and more of a dummy's bet. So all of these are pushing through. The good news is, is that the fact that there is 40% of Verizon and 25% of AT&T, and that was as of June, it's probably increased again, means that there is actually more usable, useful, interesting content than ever available on V6. And more providers are putting on real backbones and on real hardware. And gear parity has been equal for a long while. Backbone latency performance has not been equal for many of us for a long time. That is evening out. And the real growth, PCs and traditional computers are going up, but they're going up at a fairly predictable rate. Where you're seeing the truly logarithmic increases in number of handsets are smartphones and tablets, all of which are going wireless, all of which are going V6 native. So more and more of the users are going to get a better experience with V6. And that's part of that business case also. Why should I? Well, because your users will have a better experience faster, because more and more of your users are going to be using those mobile devices. Don't forget that two-thirds of the world population is still to come online. Yes. Largely in the right of AT&T frequency. Yes, and in LACNIC and AFRINIC, where it's cheaper to do wireless and cellular because there is no existing infrastructure to upgrade or that they have to amortize over 10 years to pay off. So more and more of that is happening over these new technologies. So V6 is not becoming more prevalent so much as the growing technologies are outstripping the address space faster than V4 can be cobbled and duct taped together. Other questions? OK. Um, if you have anything else, um, slides are up. My email's on the slides, or find me here at Nanog. Be happy to talk more with you. And thank you very much. Sadly, yes, they are. Because there's no other alternative structure uh, left for those two purposes. <laughs> well, there are a lot of things where the lawyers and the accountants do that the it's easier to be in non-compliance or cheaper to be non-compliance than to do the right thing, which I hate, but is indeed economic reality. So forty percent of the bandwidth um, if you look so at, yeah, go to the wireless. Yes, um, go. Yeah, God. Yeah, Verizon the landline. <laughs> Don't even get started. Um, if you go to the ITF, um, they the June ITF, they did a worldwide specific launch, and their slides with presentations from Microsoft. Yeah. Because that's yeah. what that's about what we need. I'm seeing that in a lot of places where you're getting to. Firmly into double digits. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs>